Taking the time to plan ahead and prepare the surface is crucial to having a beautiful, long-lasting laminate floor. Start by calculating how many square feet you'll need. Measuring carefully now will help you avoid any emergency trips to the store later. Measure the surface of the space carefully and sketch the area for a visual reference. Take into account that you'll have some waste from going around obstacles and fitting unusual spaces. To be safe, purchase 10 to 15% more than you calculated you'll need. Also, there may be extra flooring needed later for possible repairs. Determine how many pieces of wall base, transition profiles, and quarter round you'll need, and how many feet of underlayment if your floor doesn't have underlayment already attached. We'll talk more about these pieces later. Felt, carpet, carpet padding, and any existing wood flooring glued to the subfloor must be removed first prior to installing your laminate floor. Next, check the subfloor. It must be dry, stable, flat, and clean. Taking time to ensure that the area is flat, clean, and moisture-free will eliminate a range of problems later, primarily because dirt can prevent the planks from clicking together properly. If you're installing the laminate floor on top of a concrete subfloor, it must be tested for moisture. A simple way of doing this is with a plastic mat test. Start by placing the 36 by 36 inch mat, minimum 4 mil thick poly on the concrete surface. Tape all edges tightly with duct tape and leave for 48 hours. After removing the mat, wipe your fingers across the surface of the concrete to feel any moisture. Moisture on the surface of the concrete causes it to feel cooler. And look for a dark surface color, also a sign of moisture. If signs of moisture are found, a professional moisture test should be performed. A new concrete floor must be given plenty of time to dry out properly before conducting a moisture test. A minimum curing of 60 days is important. The next important step for concrete floor installation is a moisture barrier. This is necessary to protect your new floor from humidity and moisture that can come from the concrete surface. Next is the underlayment, which helps smooth out any unevenness in the subfloor, dampen any noise, and provide extra insulation. Some flooring manufacturers include the underlayment with their product. If the floor you choose does not have underlayment, Nalfil recommends you use only a high-quality underlayment. There are various types of underlayment products available to you. Polyethylene foam, cross-link polyethylene and polypropylene foam, natural fiber, synthetic fiber, polystyrene granulate, granulated rubber, polyurethane foam, froth foam, rebounded urethane foam, sponge rubber, cork, vinyl foam. These products may be supplied with or without moisture barrier films, so it is important to compare the vapor transmission rate of the product to a standard 6 mil grade polyethylene film, as all polymeric films are not created equal. If the subfloor is all wood, it needs to be checked carefully for patches of moisture or rot. If any problems are found, the floor needs to be removed. If the existing hardwood floorboards are in good condition, make sure they're stable. Any loose board should be secured down firmly. The crawl space under the floor must be sufficiently ventilated, and any obstacles should be removed so that rot cannot set in. Cover the area underneath the crawl space with black 6 mil poly and overlap seams a minimum of 8 inches. Where there is underfloor heating, special measures have to be taken. Consult the supplier of your heating system or visit our website for more information. Doing the job right requires proper tools, including a hammer, pencil, carpenter square, goggles, saw, ruler, and installation kit. The installation kit typically contains spacer blocks, a tapping block, and a pull bar. Knee pads are also a good idea when installing laminate floors to protect your knees and joints. And remember, if you don't feel comfortable installing a project like this on your own, Please check NALFA's website for a list of NALFA certified professional installers or contact your dealer. You can use a variety of saws to cut the laminate planks during installation. Use dustless saws when possible. Jigsaw, table saw, battery operated circular saw, telescopic shop saw, dustless cutter, chop saw, 
Drill with spade bid. Warning. Wood dust may cause irritation to eyes, skin, and upper respiratory tract. When cutting, sanding, or grinding, avoid inhalation and wear safety glasses. The use of an exhaust ventilation system is recommended. And now, the final step of preparation. Check to ensure the doors can still open and close after the laminate flooring is installed. If necessary, plane the doors to fit. Also remember to include the thickness of the underlayment when testing door clearance. Remove old baseboards where necessary. You could also leave the wall base in place and use a quarter nose or quarter round to cover the expansion gap. Now it's time to begin your installation. First, check where your main source of light enters the room. Laminate planks look their best when they run parallel with the main light source. Now, inspect each piece of flooring for visual defects and lay out the first row. It is an accepted industry practice to begin and end each row with a plank at least 8 inches long. For plank designs, measure the width of the room and divide by the width of one plank. If the remainder is 2.5 inches or less, cut down the width of the first row to allow the last row to be more than 2.5 inches wide. For tile and slate designs, the width and length of the planks in the first and last rows should be balanced. To balance the width of a pattern in a room, add the width of the last row to the width of a full plank and divide by 2. The answer is the width of the first and last rows. Start the installation in a corner of the room and work left to right or vice versa according to the manufacturer's plank or tile configuration. Remove the small tongue or locking profile from the end of the first plank in the first row that is against the wall and also cut off the extended profile sides of the plank or tile that will be against the wall. Run this trimmed edge parallel to the starting wall using expansion spacers, keeping the corners of the planks in the first row perfectly aligned. Maintain a minimum one quarter inch expansion space with spacers. Check the installation instructions of the specific laminate flooring you are using as the recommended expansion space may be different from one quarter inch. Whenever possible, use the cut pieces from the opposite wall to begin the next row or another row. Stagger the end joints according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Once the first row is in place, you'll be able to see if the wall is even. If it appears uneven, scribe or draw the contour of the wall on the planks. Disassemble the row and trim the row along the line you've drawn. Reassemble the row once it's been cut. For most installations, mixing planks from a minimum of three different boxes helps you obtain the best visual effect. But please note that not all manufacturers recommend this procedure. Read your installation instructions carefully. When you reach the end of a row, measure and trim the last plank to fit. A good way to measure the length of the board required is to rotate the loose board by 180 degrees facing upwards so that the groove is facing the groove of the previous row. Rest the board next to the first row, then mark and cut the boards to size. Remember to leave at least one quarter inch for expansion. A sharp carbide tip blade with a high tooth count cutting into the decorative surface will avoid chipping. Use the remainder of the cut plank to start the next row, or another row, if it is more than eight inches long. Stagger the end joints according to manufacturer's recommendations. This step may not apply to tile or slate installations. When you reach doorways during your installation, it is also very easy to undercut the door jamb for a nice finished look. All you need is a piece of flooring, a piece of underlayment if flooring does not have attached underlayment, and a handsaw. Simply place the laminate plank on top of the underlayment against the door jamb and hold your handsaw flat against the plank. Saw through the door jamb, pry out the wood, and slip the laminate and underlayment underneath. It's that easy. To install flooring around pipes, Drill a hole in the plank three-quarter inch larger than the pipe diameter. Cut the plank across the center of the circle. Position on the floor, and if recommended by the manufacturer, glue the plank pieces back together. Do not glue laminate to the subfloor. Cover expansion gaps with molding or pipe rings when the floor is complete. All pipes require silicone sealant in the expansion space. When you're ready to cut the last row, 
place a full row of planks directly on top of the last installed row of planks. Use the full width of a scrap piece of plank. Place the tongue side against the wall and pencil against the extended groove and mark a line the length of the wall. Cut along the pencil line. Leaving the tongue and groove on the scrap piece will automatically allow for the minimum one quarter inch expansion space needed. Most laminate flooring is resistant to water and may be installed in kitchens, bathrooms, and laundry rooms. However, it is very important to prevent water or moisture from seeping under flooring. There are certain steps that should be followed to prevent moisture problems in these areas. In kitchens, bathrooms, and laundry rooms, fill all expansion and transition molding spaces subject to moisture or plumbing leaks, such as in front of the sinks, toilets, dishwashers, and around the refrigerator with moisture-resistant 100% silicone sealant. Toilets must be removed and the perimeter of the flange and pipes sealed after installing laminate flooring. All expansion spaces will later be covered with baseboards, quarter round, or transition moldings once the spacers are removed. Fixed cabinets must be installed prior to installation of laminate flooring in order to allow the flooring to expand and contract freely. Laminate floors must not be installed in areas with a floor drain or sump pump. Most laminate flooring can be used in combination with many types of in-floor heating. The heating system can be cast in a concrete floor or in a thin layer of filler on the surface of a concrete subfloor. It can also be installed under a wood subfloor or installed on the surface of a subfloor as matting. Follow the instructions from the supplier of the floor heating system. The heating system must be in operation for at least two weeks prior to the installation of laminate flooring. The system may be turned off or set to a suitable installation temperature. 65 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. After installation, the temperature may be increased slowly at the rate of approximately 5 degrees per day and should not exceed 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Follow the instructions from the manufacturer of the floor heating system that does not conflict with the above.